My name is Eric Werland, and I represent the organizers of this uh, very special event. I'm very pleased to see you all, and it's a great privilege that Noam Chomsky has agreed to come to Utrecht and deliver a lecture to our students on responsibility and integrity, the dilemmas we face. The primary goal of our humanities lecture series is to motivate our students to look beyond their disciplines, become aware of broader connections, and to enable them to play the role in society that our society needs, to be able to distinguish what's going on under, behind the surface. This crucial awareness is what we as organizers are convinced Noam Chomsky's lecture will help you develop an awareness of what is hidden beyond the facades of institutional newspeak. And that's why we are here together. What does a brain of a dean of humanities look like when it's asked to introduce Noam Chomsky? When Erik Reuland asked me, I thought, this is a chance of a lifetime and immediately called my colleague at the medical center. <laughs> With an ambulance, they took me to the 7 Tesla and started the MRI procedure. Clearly, we could see that there were several functions in the brain activated at different stages. First of all, the large area of proudness in the left part lightened up. Years later, this dean would be able to say to everyone in the nursing home, time and again, I introduced Noam Chomsky. <laughs> the only thing the dean hoped for was that by then the nurses would be so kind to believe him. <laughs> then the brain activity moved to the right part, near the area of despair. Introducing Noam Chomsky was a hopeless and even impossible enterprise. Anything that would come out of the dean's mouth would be hopelessly irrelevant for everybody in the audience, since everyone knew who he was. Proof, even before eating the pudding, was that it took only two seconds before all seats for this event were sold. Close to this area, the small spot of hope flared up. Yes, maybe there was one listener who did not know who Chomsky was. The dean would design his speech exclusively for that one lost, poor, and wandering soul. As the scan proceeded, the dean started designing his academic and therefore familiar introduction. He would give the audience the titles of the books Noam Chomsky had written. For that's what all scholars do with someone who needs to be introduced. First, they name the title. Then they give a short description of the content. And finally, they give a brief overview of the impact the books had made. Lying in the seven Tesla, the dean took his cell phone and called Eric. How much time did he have for his introduction? Five minutes, Eric replied. But I need at least five hours, the dean cried out. Noam Chomsky has published 105 books between 1957, when syntactic structure saw the light, and October last year, 2010, when Gaza in crisis appeared. So one hour for reading the titles, and the second hour for giving a description of the content, not only linguistics, but also philosophy, like power and ideology from 1987, or the Chomsky-Foucault debate from 2006. But not only philosophy, but also political theory, like American power and the new mandarins from 1969, to failed states, the abuse of power, and the assault on democracy from 2006 and the other three hours the dean needed for discussing the impact. He would have to limit himself to only a tiny part of this world, the Netherlands, Europe, the United States, 
and the Middle East. When the scan was finished, the dean walked out of the hospital like a new man. His brains felt clear and totally blank, like fresh fallen snow. He knew the opening line of his introductory speech. He would say, Dear Professor Chomsky, that was the idea. And then he would read a poem by one of his most beloved poets, Mark Strand. It was called The Idea. For us, too, there was a wish to possess something beyond the world we knew, beyond ourselves, beyond our power to imagine, something nevertheless in which we might see ourselves. And this desire came always in passing, in waning light, and in such cold that ice on the valley's lakes cracked and rolled, and blowing snow <coughs> covered what earth we saw. And scenes from the past, when they surfaced again, looked not as they had, but ghostly and white, among false curves and hidden erasures. And never once did we feel we were close, until the night wind said, why do this? Especially now, go back to the place you belong. And there appeared, with its windows glowing, small in the distance, in the frozen reaches, a cabin. And we stood before it, amazed at its being there, and would have gone forward and opened the door, and stepped into the glow, and warmed ourselves there, but that it was ours, by not being ours, and should remain empty. That was the idea. Professor Chomsky, welcome. not used to such eloquent introductions that makes it a hard act to follow. But, uh, uh, the term uh, intellectuals in the modern sense, in the sense in which we now use it, uh, pretty much came into uh, a conventional usage with the uh, Dreyfusards in the late 19th century. And they're now very much uh, honored for their courage and standing up for uh, justice and, uh, uh, and uh, human rights. Uh, however, it's worth remembering that the Dreyfusards were a small minority. The great mass of uh, intellectuals in France and elsewhere uh, supported the state. And that's pretty typical. In fact, that helps us distinguish two interpretations of the common phrase, responsibility of intellectuals. Uh, one interpretation has to do with the uh, functions, the tasks, the role uh, that they actually fulfill, question of fact. Uh, another is a uh, question of value, uh, what role should they fulfill? Uh, it would be nice to say that the answer to these two questions is the same, but uh, in fact what the rather, rather typical situation is what in fact was uh, illustrated by the uh, by the Dreyfusard example. Uh, if you go f a few years beyond, into the early years of the last century, uh, World War I, uh, the intellectual classes on all sides uh, passionately supported their own states uh, in, in the First World War. Uh, there were a few exceptions, as there always are. Uh, in England, uh, Bertrand Russell, in Germany, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Karl Liebknecht uh, in uh, the United States, uh, Eugene Debs, uh, they all ended up in jail, uh, which reflects another aspect of uh, uh, intellectual life. Uh, those who depart from the assigned task, uh, support for power, framing of issues to uh, provide justifications for power, they usually uh, suffer in one way or another. Uh, how, how they suffer depends on the character of the state, but it's, uh, it's pretty common. So, for example, uh, uh, 
in the Soviet Union, in the old Soviet Union, in the post-Stalin era, uh, the intellectuals we call dissidents uh, were treated pretty badly. Uh, for example, uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, Václav Havel was jailed, uh, house arrest, uh, uh, insulted, condemned. Uh, similarly, in, in the other countries of Eastern Europe, sometimes worse, but that was the typical uh, uh, situation. Well, that was bad, but it could have been worse. Uh, so, for example, Havel uh, and his associates uh, could have had their uh, brains blown out by elite Czech forces uh, uh, fresh from training in the Soviet Union uh, who already had uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, bloodied victims to their credit. But that's not invented. That's what happened in exactly the same time in uh, U.S. domains. That happened to be in El Salvador uh, one week after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, the, an elite unit of the uh, Salvadoran army, uh, fresh from training at the uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School in uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, on the explicit orders of the government and the high command, which have since surfaced, uh, broke into the university, uh, Jesuit University, killed the rector, six leading Jesuit intellectuals, uh, major figures in Latin American intellectual life, uh, blew their brains out, killed their uh, housekeeper and daughter because the orders were not to leave any victims, uh, and uh, then uh, escaped. The, this battalion had already killed, uh, had a bloody roll of victims in the preceding 10 years. There were 10 years of major atrocities, beginning with the assassination of an archbishop reading mass, uh, called the Voice for the Voiceless, Archbishop Romero, and plenty of religious martyrs in between, plenty of uh, intellectuals attacked and killed in between. Many escaped, uh, many escaped to uh, Nicaragua, which in the 1980s was kind of like Paris in the 1930s, uh, the place where people escaped from the uh, terror states surrounding them. Then it was Stalinist Russia, Nazi Germany in uh, the 1980s. It was the various uh, terror states that the U.S. was uh, funding, supporting, uh, uh, and uh, participating in their crimes. Uh, the uh, 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 what, what happened in El Salvador was bad enough. It was about 70,000 killed almost entirely. The government-related security forces funded by the U.S., trained and armed by them. Uh, but the other countries were even worse. In Guatemala was about 100,000, and Nicaragua maybe 30,000. Uh, altogether, about 200,000 people killed in the 1980s. Uh, that was called a war on terror. Uh, Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981 and declared that the uh, a core function of U.S. foreign policy would be uh, to combat the plague of the modern age, uh, return to barbarism in our time, uh, namely uh, inter state supported international terrorism. Now that episode has kind of been disappeared from history to borrow the Latin American transitive verb disappear. It's been eliminated, kind of wrong story, wrong agency, not the right kind of thing to remember. Uh, it, uh, it goes back much before that. This uh, war on uh, the, the murder of the Jesuit intellectuals in 1989 uh, terminated a long uh, campaign of terror and brutality that started in the early 1960s. Uh, the, uh, it started actually with Vatican II. Uh, Vatican II in 1962 uh, was a, an attempt by the Pope, Pope John XXIII, to institute a really radical change in church history. As you probably know, uh, the, uh, he, he, want, he tried to restore uh, the church of early Christianity, the Gospels, what they actually say, a message of uh, radical pacifism which is, of course, why the early Christians were persecuted. That changed in the fourth century when 
the Roman Empire took over the church, made it the church of the persecutors, not the church of the persecuted, in the phrase of uh, distinguished theologian Hans Kung, one of those punished in the uh, period of the 60s and 70s. Uh, he, uh, he, he wasn't killed, he was just kind of kept from teaching and so on. Uh, the, he was lucky. Uh, in 1962, um, at Vatican II, the, uh, uh, the uh, Pope declared uh, an effort to return the church to its original mission, to be the church of the persecuted, a very significant change. And it was taken seriously, particularly in Latin America. Uh, Latin American, the Latin American bishops uh, adopted that program. They adopted what was called the, the preferential option for the poor, message that comes out of the Gospels. And uh, priests and uh, nuns, uh, lay persons, uh, went to the countryside, uh, uh, tr tried to organize peasants into base communities where they would read the Gospels, uh, think about ways to uh, adopt measures to uh, survive somehow in the extremely harsh domains of U.S. power. Now, that was a heresy that was not going to be tolerated. Uh, the U.S. very quickly launched a war against the church. It, uh, the church and all social movements uh, that were participating in these similar efforts. It began very quickly in 1964. The, uh, a military coup took place in Brazil, overthrowing the civilian government that had actually been prepared by the Kennedy administration, carried out shortly after Kennedy's assassination. Now that established a, what was called a national security state, kind of a neo-Nazi style uh, terror and torture state. Uh, Brazil's a big country, a big influence. Uh, a plague spread through the hemisphere, uh, Chile, uh, Uruguay, Argentina, one country after another, uh, similar uh, phenomena, plenty of religious martyrs because they were in the forefront. And it continued through Central America in the 1980s. Uh, it uh, essentially terminated with the murder of the six Jesuit intellectuals in uh, November 1989, right at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, it's well known to scholarship that the terror and atrocities and brutality and slaughter in uh, Latin America from the sixth, from 1960 to uh, the end of the century uh, were incomparably worse than anything that happened in Eastern Europe in those years. What happened in Eastern Europe was bad enough, but uh, what went on in uh, Western domains was incomparably worse. Now, that's known to scholarship. For example, you can read it in the uh, recently published uh, uh, at Cambridge University History of the Cold War, kind of comment on it. Uh, but it's not known to the public. Uh, what's known to the public is the suffering of the East European dissidents, which was real, and they should be respected and honored. But in comparison with what was happening elsewhere, they were pretty lucky, uh, far luckier than uh, the Jesuits of El Salvador, or the Archbishop, or many others during those years. Well, uh, the task, one of the, the task of intellectuals is to, re, is to ensure that we know about the East European dissidents, and we pride ourselves on our heroism in supporting them, uh, but we don't know about the, the ones who we slaughtered and tortured and killed. Uh, that's out of history, not to be remembered. Uh, I happened to be in Europe uh, in November, in November uh, 2009 at the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and there was a great deal of uh, euphoria, self-congratulation uh, uh, about our uh, great uh, uh, courage in supporting uh, dissidents in the enemy's domain, uh, but there wasn't a word about what happened in uh, uh, Latin America, primarily carried out by the United States, but with the strong support of its European allies all the way through. Well, that's the a typical task of the uh, intellectuals. Uh, if you go back to, say, the Vietnam War, uh, there was protest, substantial protest, uh, mostly on the part of uh, 
uh, young people, um, students, uh, 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 people outside the elite intellectual circles. There was some protest there, but very muted and quite interesting in its character. I've written about it if you want the details. Uh, up through the early years of the war, it was overwhelmingly strong support for the war. There was virtually no protest. In fact, support for the war was so strong that very few people, even today, know when the war began. It actually began uh, just 50 years ago, in 1961. Uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy at the time, uh, sent the American Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam, uh, authorized the use of uh, napalm, uh, chemical warfare to uh, destroy crops and uh, ground cover, uh, programs to drive the uh, rural population, which was overwhelmingly supportive of the guerrillas as they knew, uh, to drive them into uh, uh, what amounted to concentration camps called strategic hamlets, to surround them with barbed wire, to protect them from the guerrillas who they were strongly supporting. Uh, it ended up with millions of people being driven out. I don't have to describe what happened to South Vietnam was virtually destroyed. The war expanded to the rest of the uh, of Indochina, uh, always with European support uh, and with virtually no criticism. Uh, by the about 1966 or 67, there were a few voices of criticism in educated circles on the grounds that it was uh, not working very well. Same kind of grounds you hear today in Afghanistan or you hear, heard a couple of years ago about Iraq. It wasn't working too well, you know, maybe it was a mistake. Uh, in 1968, everything changed. In January 1968, there was an amazing uprising in South Vietnam. There's been nothing like it in history. Uh, the country was saturated with over half a million American troops, uh, over 100,000 Thai, Korean, other mercenaries, a uh, huge uh, uh, army, you know, seven or 800,000 people. Every village penetrated uh, 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 informants everywhere. Uh, all of a sudden, in January uh, 1968, there was an uprising which no one knew about. Everyone had kept quiet, and it was all over the country, practically. Uh, you know, I went, broke into the American embassy, you know, uh, uh, this is the Tet Offensive. I don't think there's ever been a case of such uh, uh, overwhelming commitment to a revolutionary cause. No one even talked about it, and it was a surprise everywhere. Well, that struck a chord with the American business community, the ones who are decisive in determining policy. It got them to recognize that this war isn't worth fighting any longer. We've basically won our objectives, uh, it's a waste of money and time, and they pressured the government, a pretty strong power play, to reverse policy. And the government did follow orders, reverse policy, started uh, withdrawing troops, entered in negotiations, uh, the president announced that he's not going to run for a second term, and so on. Uh, the intellectuals responded almost reflexively, all of a sudden, everybody became a long-term opponent of the war without any trace that anyone can find. In fact, the record says the opposite, but that was the new party line. We're long-term opponents of the war, uh, got to get out, uh, it was a mistake, shouldn't have gotten in, and so on. Uh, there, there, are, there are a number of uh, leading figures in the Kennedy administration who wrote memoirs uh, Arthur Schlesinger, uh, uh, Roger Hillsman, Theodore Sorensen, others, they rewrote their memoirs, literally. The early memoirs, the ones written at the time, if you look at them, were fully supportive of the war or often didn't even mention it because it was so uninteresting. Uh, the post-1968 story, uh, which is the one that enters into history, is uh, Kennedy was going to pull out of Vietnam, everybody was opposed, uh, uh, you know, should have never gotten in the first place. It's the bad Texan, Lyndon Johnson, who turned everything around. Uh, and uh, we, the intellectuals, were uh, uh, passionate opponents of the war. We 
make our case. That's the more or less official story today. Uh, there is, a, uh, by now, the, uh, if, if you go to 1975, when the war officially ended, it's quite interesting to look at what was being written then and what popular attitudes were then. Uh, at that time, among the public, about 70% of the population in polls uh, said that the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. That's 70% of the population. Not a phrase like that in the uh, educated community. In fact, at the outside limits of criticism, say in the New York Times, uh, the most dissident uh, journalist, Anthony Lewis, uh, wrote that uh, the war began with blundering efforts to do good. Uh, efforts to do good is tautological. Uh, the U.S. government was carrying out, it out, so it was efforts to do good. Uh, blundering, yeah, it didn't work. So it began with blundering efforts to do good, but by 1969, that's after the Tet Offensive, it had become clear that uh, the war was a mistake and that we could not achieve our, by definition, noble objectives uh, at a cost acceptable to ourselves. So it was really a mistake. That's the uh, critical end of uh, elite educated dissident opinion at a time when 70% of the population said, no, it's not a mistake, it's fundamentally wrong and immoral. Now, those are phrases that don't appear in uh, uh, educated discourse, wrong and immoral. Maybe wrong because it didn't work, but not immoral. Uh, and that's very typical. Uh, take a look at current uh, debate about, uh, uh, say, Iraq. Uh, at the outer limits of uh, criticism within the educated mainstream, uh, you have, for example, Barack Obama, who is very strongly praised and honored for his uh, principle of opposition to the war. Uh, what was his principle to opposition? He said it's a strategic blunder. We're not going to be able to do it at a cost acceptable to ourselves. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Nazi generals after Stalingrad. Uh, after Stalingrad, I'm sure there was criticism in the German general staff of uh, Hitler's blunders. Uh, why fight a two-front war when you should have knocked out England first and then gone ahead? So yeah, it was a strategic blunder. If we don't call that principled criticism. Uh, I don't have records from the German general staff, but we do have records from the Soviet Union. Uh, if you read Pravda in the mid-1980s, that's the way they described the war in Afghanistan. It was a strategic blunder. It should never have gotten into it. Again, we don't call that principled criticism. We don't honor and respect them for that stand. But when it's done on our side, that's exactly what we do. Well, I uh, could go on and on about this, but uh, this, is, this is the task of the intellectuals, overwhelmingly, and the task that they fulfill. Uh, uh, focus on the crimes of enemies, uh, the fate of the dissidents in Eastern Europe, suppress totally your own crimes, even if they're incomparably worse as they were in, uh, at the same, in the same years in Latin America, for example, uh, case after cases like this, and ensure that uncomfortable information doesn't bother the general public. So take, say, Holland right now. Uh, as you know, I'm sure uh, a couple of days ago, a trial ended uh, in The Hague, the trial of Charles Taylor for uh, uh, terrible crimes in Sierra Leone. Uh, the case was narrower than what the prosecutors wanted. The prosecutors, who were one of them's a distinguished uh, law professor in the United States, the other a well-known barrister in London, they wanted a much broader case. They had collected, they claim, massive evidence uh, to implicate Gaddafi in the crime. Uh, he'd been massively funding Taylor, participating, sending arms. So they wanted to broaden the case to uh, include Gaddafi. Well, the U.S. and Britain blocked it. And the International Criminal Court, of course, takes orders from the masters. So they narrowed the case, and no mention of Gaddafi. And uh, I don't read the Dutch press, but uh, you can tell me uh, how much uh, reporting there was about this. I'll be willing.